I'm Tim Roble and this is Garage Customs. Today I'd like to take you through my journey in selecting a new welder for my Garage Customs shop and how I came about going with the Everlast PowerTig 200DX. So let's get started. So the first thing that I did is I sat down with a clean sheet of paper and I defined the parameters that I was looking for out of my next welder. And number one on my list was simply I needed 100% control over the weld puddle, especially on the AC side. Those of you who may have known, I used to use the Miller 250DX Synchrowave TIG Runner package. And that's a transformer rectifier unit, and that only gives you 60 hertz that comes right out of the wall. With the new inverter machines, what that does is it allows you to go up above 60 hertz and tune in your weld characteristics and it allows you to weld with a sharpened tungsten. So why would I want to weld with a pointed tungsten on the AC side? My answer is super simple. More control over what I'm doing. I'm sure there's a lot of you old school welders out there that use the green top, the pure tungsten, AC, balled up, washes in, and you've had no problem your whole career, your whole lifetime of welding. For myself, I did that for about 20 years until I had the ability to try out an inverter machine. And what I found out was once I sharpened that tungsten and I got away from the 60 hertz, I can start fine tuning that arc and making a very nice weld characteristic for what I'm doing. Point being, like if I'm doing an intake manifold and there might be a bolt hole in the runner real close, I might turn this machine up to around 120, 150 hertz and that gives me the ability to not nip away at the hole and wash everything in real nice and have a real nice bead appearance. So that's why I would choose an inverter. Let me take you through the setup of this new machine and then I'll show you how the frequency actually affects the weld on the AC side. So let's get to it. Let's start off with the number one mistake people make when hooking up an inverter machine. We have the work clamp or the ground and the ground actually gets installed on the positive side. Put that in and give it a twist and lock it down. Next is our gas outlet for our argon gas or whatever mix that you're using. Simply just like an air compressor fitting just pushes in and locks in. Next we have control. Right now I have the foot pedal installed to use as like a rheostat on the ground. This machine also comes with another hookup for a torch trigger that can either be used in the 2T or the 4T mode. So that makes it really nice. Comes standard with the air-cooled SR26 torch. We can get the stubby consumables and as I can afford it I'll put a water cooler on this because usually I exceed the limits of what an air-cooled torch can do. But hooking up the torch is simple also. It gets installed on the negative side and it simply just goes in and gives a turn and locks down. Take you through a quick process of building the torch. I like to start off with the collet body first. Just give that a nice little screw in. Then I'll select the appropriate collet. This is for 330 seconds tungsten. 2% lanthanated tungsten that I'm using sharpened to a point. I can use this on both the AC and the DC side so I never need to really change tungsten with whatever I'm doing. Drop that down. Now I have a long piece in, so this is the consumable pack that came with the unit. I'll use the long top and I'll go ahead and screw that down. Then I'll select a number six cup. And I'll set my tungsten length, which I tend to run about an eighth to three sixteenths, sometimes a quarter inch stick out for normal. Sometimes you'll have to do different things to change things up. And you just simply tighten that down and that takes the collet, pushes it to the collet body and everything's tight. So that's it for building of the torch. So here we have our argon flow regulator that comes with this unit. Something to note that it's in liters per minute, not cubic feet per hour. So standard, like if you were going to flow here in America, I would normally flow on aluminum somewhere between about 15 and 20 cubic feet per hour. So on liters per minute, probably the best way to do that would be just to divide it in half. So we'd be flowing here around 10 liters per minute, which would be equivalent approximately to 20 cubic feet per hour. 
Why I selected the Everlast PowerTig 200DX in the 2013 model is because I like how this panel is laid out. It's easy to read, it's color coded, it's logical and it makes sense to me. Up top we have our rheostat for amps. On the DC side we go from 5 to 200 amps. On the AC side we go from 20 to 200 amps. Over here we have our green downslope that goes from 0 to 25 seconds that we'll use in our 4T mode. We have our pre-flow that goes from 0 to 10 seconds. We have our post-flow that goes from 0 to 25 seconds. These blue knobs right here deal with our pulse. With this and pulse off, none of these come into play so I don't even have to worry about where they're set. Pulse low and pulse high. Now we have pulse frequency, pulse amps, and pulse on time that we can dial in to get the exact weld characteristic we're desiring. Up top, for those that know me, I don't ever stick weld. Um, coming from the off-road and uh, motorcycle fabrication aircraft side, I really just don't have a need to stick weld. But what this does is it's arc force and it's basically how deep and how much penetration you're going to get in that arc force. So we have our high frequency TIG, lift TIG, and then if we want to use our stick mode, now this comes into play. Go back up to high frequency. Why would we use lift TIG? Well, we would do that if we were playing somewhere that had high frequency electronics. Maybe you had a quick repair to do at a hospital, but they can't have any high frequency throwing off any of their EKG machines or something. So you'd put that to lift and that takes the high frequency start out of it. So you'd actually have to touch the tungsten and then as you lift it'll actually ignite. I leave that up in high frequency about 99.9% .9 of the time. Over here on our yellow knobs, this is why I select a machine like this, the inverter technology. Because I can dial in my frequency from 20 to 250 hertz and then on my balance my less cleaning would be down like at 30% and more cleaning would be up at 70%. So usually less cleaning means more penetration and more cleaning means it's going to etch out a wider zone and actually break up some of that oxide that's on that aluminum and allow us to weld with a nice clean puddle with not a lot of uh, like black peppering in it. Here I am up at 240 hertz. You can really hear the machine zinging. What that's doing is providing a very tight, very focused, pinpointed arc. You'll notice that the bead width is very narrow on this. As I'm coming to the end of the panel, I'm starting to lift up on my foot pedal. And at the end, this is where I notice actually that the downslope works with the foot pedal also. You can see a little bit of cratering. I need to turn up the downslope. Now I've dropped down to 120 hertz. This is more of a zone that I tend to operate in on a normal basis. Get a little heat in the material, and now I'm starting to dab and move along with a nice rhythm. You can see the etching zone that's kind of breaking up. I'm running right at 40% cleaning on all of the test plates. Now down at 60 hertz, we can really hear the grunt of this machine. You can see just a little less stable arc that's providing just a little bit bigger footprint. There's definitely some times that you may use 60 hertz. You might want that big footprint to be able to weld actually super thin material, provide a bigger footprint, but it's really nice to be able to have the tunability to tune in the characteristics you're looking for on a machine. With the three test plates laid out next to each other, you can see the difference in the bead width. At 60 hertz, we're real wide, and 240, it tightened everything up. I use the exact same anchorage for each plate. As you can see from our little demonstration, that you have the ability now to control your bead width and kind of narrow that focus. As we go higher in hertz, that bead width gets a little tighter and a little more focused and would be easier to wash up into a corner um, that you weren't wanting to nip away an edge. So I hope you learned something from the video. Thank you for watching the Garage Customs episode. I'm Tim Roble, and I'll catch you here next time.